Let's see, today you are the boss at the Goodman Institute of Public Policy Research. Big in the healthcare issues. This is his reputation. The Wall Street Journal says that he's the father of health savings accounts. Before HSAs, he was the father of MSAs. Does anybody remember those? Okay, all right. I mean, not that So he founded this institute in, I'm sorry, 19, 2000, two years ago. Okay, this, this is 16, 2014. Doing exactly what he did at NCPA, working with the same wonderful people who all day long sit and think about what we can do to make healthcare more efficient, more effective, and less expensive in America. I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. John Goodman. He's a great speaker. He will take a lot of questions, and he'll be the judge of when he wants to start accepting them. Thanks, Dr. Goodman. telling you what I think you want to hear, for you to ask me and tell me what you want to hear. But there are a few things I want to go over first. Um, as I was getting up from the table, someone said, you know, be sure and turn off your cell phone. I said, why should I do that? I mean, you can have an emergency call and you can never talk, right? Uh, that wasn't serious. The reason I have a cell phone with me is to make a point. Wow. There are more cell phones in the United States than our teachers. Even the panhandler down here on the street corner, he probably has a cell phone, but he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. Uh, if something goes wrong with my iPhone in Dallas, there are a dozen places I can pop into without an appointment, and I can get quick, high quality, reasonably priced uh, service, uh, just like that. Uh, there are places that will send someone to my condo and repair my iPhone in my home. There's a national organization called iHospital, and the people who work for it are called eye doctors. But if something happens to me, uh, that you know the average weight in the United States for patients to see a new doctor is three weeks. And in Boston, where we're told they had universal coverage even before there was Obamacare, the average weight is two months. And amazingly, one out of every 10 individuals who goes to a hospital emergency room leaves without ever seeing a doctor just because they get tired of waiting. And in some places in this country, it's one in five, which is what it is up in Canada. So my question to you is, why is the market so kind to my iPhone and so means to me? And I think the answer is that this iPhone is produced and repaired in real markets, real prices, where entrepreneurs know that they can make millions of dollars if they meet our needs. Whereas over in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market, year after year, decade after decade, that no one ever sees the real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, no employer, no employee. Uh, we like to think that we're really different in this country from the healthcare system of Canada, uh, but in my opinion, we're about 85% the same. You know, we bought into the same idea that Canada and Britain and Europe has bought into, and that is that people shouldn't have to choose between healthcare and other uses of money. Healthcare should be free at the point of delivery. And as a consequence, in Canada, it really is free. You don't pay anything when you see a doctor. But in the United States, it's almost free. You know, every time we spend a dollar at a doctor's office, only 10 cents is coming out of our own pocket. The other 90 cents is coming from a third party payer, employer, insurance company, or government. What we have overlooked is that when you suppress the price system, when you suppress money prices, you elevate the importance of all the non market barriers to care. Um, have you ever noticed that when you go see another professional, a lawyer, accountant, architect, engineer, you know, over that outer office area, it's called a reception area, right? But when you go to the doctor's office, what do you call it? Waiting room. Exactly. Uh, so we're all very accustomed to paying for health care with time rather than money. Now, what I mean by non-market barriers of care? Well, I mean, how long does it take you on the phone to get an appointment with the doctor? Uh, how many days, you, and, and then how many days, how many weeks, how many months you have to wait before you actually see that doctor? 
And then how long does it take you to get from your office or your home to the doctor's office and back again? And once you're there at your office, how long do you have to wait before you see the doctor? Those are non-price barriers to health care. And there's a lot of evidence that we can talk about if you'd like that show that not just the middle class, but poor families, or poor families, those non-market barriers are a greater obstacle to health care than the fee that the doctor charges. In this country, there are about 50 million people on food stamps. And people on food stamps can walk into just about any supermarket you walk into. They can buy just about any product you buy. They're paying the same price that you pay. When they get to the checkout stand, they put down their food stamps, put down money on top of it if they need it, or at least that's the way they used to do it. Now you have a card. But in any event, um, they're paying the same price as you and I are paying. And you never hear it said that we have a shortage of supermarkets in this country. Right? I mean, the, uh, the worst that's going to happen is somebody has to get on a bus and travel a couple of miles. But you don't have supermarkets in this country saying, we're not taking any more food stamp customers. Right? And you never hear it said that, uh, uh, that, that supermarkets are not available to poor people. Um, and why is that? It's because we allow the price system to work. Now, over in healthcare, we have about 65 million people now on Medicaid, and maybe they're the same people. And in the Medicaid market, what's the biggest problem people have? It's finding a doctor who will see them. And when they can't, what do they do? They go to community health centers, they go down to the park the hospital, or they can wait four, five, six hours, unless they're bleeding all over the floor. Uh, depending on the day of the week and the time of the day. I was in Massachusetts not that long ago and I had a female taxi cab driver. I started talking to her about um, health care in Massachusetts. And she said she's on Mass Health, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. And I said, well, how's it working? She said, well, I had to go down a list of 20 doctors before I found one that was in it. And so we going down the yellow pages? And she said, no, no, I was going down a list that Mass Health gave me. That's what they call universal coverage in Massachusetts. Now, while we're having all of these problems of low-income people not having access or very good access to health care, we have in this country now, I think, 2,000 walk-in clinics. And you all are familiar with them. You see there's a pharmacy called the Minute Clinics. And the reason they chose the name Minute Clinic is because they want to signal to you that they know your time is valuable as well as your money. Um, here in Dallas, um, if you go to the mini clinic, uh, you will, would pay about twice as much for an earache or sore throat as, uh, as Medicaid pays. So while the mini clinic services you and me, I've actually been in one, uh, they're very high quality by the way. They follow best practices better than primary care physicians on the average. They're very good at knowing what they can do and not do when they need to refer. Um, but, um, but they're not available to the Medicaid population because we don't allow the Medicaid patients to do in health care what they're allowed to do for food. Uh, if the Medicaid patient tries to pull out of her purse money and add it to Medicaid's uh, rate, well, the nurse receiving the money can go to prison, maybe the Medicaid patient can go to prison as well. So we have criminalized, we don't we just make it legal, we criminalize uh, letting the market work in health care. If we allowed Medicaid patients to pay for health care the way they pay for food, we overnight would enormously expand access to health care for our low income population. It would be an enormous change in our health care system. So I say that if we want the health care system to work, we have to start with the patient, we have to free the patient. And then we have to free the doctor. Um, have any of you noticed? that uh, it's very difficult to get a doctor to talk to you on the phone, unless you're Oscar. This is new, though. Unless you're teledoc, that's new. But conventional doctors, conventional health insurance, we don't do this, right? And you know why that is? You can't do it. And what? You can't do it. Yeah, very good. Um, the doctor doesn't get paid to talk to you on the phone. Why is that? It's because... Um, the way Medicaid, I'm sorry, the way Medicare pays doctors is they pay them a fee for certain services. And there's 7,500 tasks that doctors are paid to do by Medicare. Each one has a price. And this is the worst way to pay any professional. It's a horrible way to pay a doctor, an accountant, or a lawyer. Uh, 
this is the way we pay doctors, the way Medicare pays, the way Blue Cross pays, and the way most insurance companies pay. So when they drew up this list years ago of 7,500 tests, somebody left the telephone off the list. Right? It's not on the list in any convenient, practical way, I put it that way. And what else did they leave off the list? They left off email. Everybody emails each other these days. I email my lawyer, I, I, I text my lawyer, I talk by phone, but not my doctor. I did, by the way, get emails from Minute Clinic. Minute Clinic's very good. You know, it's fall season, your children going back to school, you have your flu shot, spring, you know, come by for allergy treatment. I mean, they let you know what services they have and how they can meet your needs, but my doctor's not doing that. He's not doing that because that's something else that was listed left off the list of what Medicare pays for. And there's something else that was left off the list that I think is really fascinating. Uh, this name, Jeffrey Brenner, do you all that strike a bell with anybody? The term hotspots. Some of you know about that. Brenner is this doctor in, uh, in Camden, uh, New Jersey, which I told is one of the poorest counties in the whole uh, country. And almost everybody in Camden is either on Medicare, or they're on Medicaid, or they're uninsured. Probably any private insurance. So Brenner is a scientist, he's a doctor, he's trying to figure out what's going on in Camden, and uh, he's going down the list of the hospital, and he notices that 1% of all the people who live in Camden are spending 30% of all the hospital's money every year. So he goes down the list of 1%, he identifies this man, he weighs more than 600 pounds, uh, he's, uh, he's an alcoholic, he's a drug addict, uh, he's diabetic. Uh, he spends half the year in the hospital and the other half the year abusing himself. <coughs> so Brenner takes this guy under his wing, he uh, gets him off drugs, gets him off alcohol, uh, gets him going to AA, he finds out the guy's a Christian, so he gets him going to church. Uh, he signs him up for some welfare so he can have some financial stability in his life. And pretty soon this guy isn't going to the hospital anymore. So his costs are going down, down, down. Tens of thousands of dollars for saving just on this one patient. So then Brenner uh, establishes a clinic and uh, he's taking in more patients just like this one. Really high cost patients. Patients costing the system lots of money. And uh, Brenner tells me he can drive down the streets of Camden and point to whole buildings and tell you how much the whole building is costing Medicare and Medicaid costing us as taxpayers. Um, so, so Brenner, um, well, let me ask you a question. For uh, these days, he's saving Medicare and Medicaid millions of dollars treating patients just the way he treat, treated the one I just told you about. So of all the money he saves Medicare, and therefore you as taxpayers, how much do you think Medicare gives back to Brenner? Zero. Zero. And how about Medicaid? How much do you think Medicaid does? Zero. <laughs> Okay, and why is that? It's because, uh, just like the telephone, just like the email, uh, here is another set of services that are not on Medicare's list of tasks. What I described to you a moment ago, what he did for this 600 pound guy, is mainly social services. Right? It's not really medical care. It's changing this guy's lifestyle, but that's what we needed to do in order to save tens of thousands, and then when you sum over these people, it's millions. Uh, where the term hotspots comes from is he tells me that patients um, that cost the system a lot of money tend to live near each other, live in the same buildings. I don't know why that is, but it just turns out that's what it is. Well, uh, before there was a Barack Obama, I went to the Bush administration, folks, sat down with Health and Human Services, and I said, you know, you ought to give Brenner a million dollars. They looked at me like it was totally crazy, and uh, so I had to spell it out for them. <laughs> They wanted to know, well, why should we give Brenner any money when he's doing what we already want him to do? And so I carefully explained, well, look, if you allowed Brenner to become a millionaire, and then you told every other doctor in the country what you've done, then they would all be searching around trying to find ways to save money from the government. But if you said to them, you know, you raise quality, and you, you cut costs, we'll, we'll share in, in those savings with you. Well, that was the most radical idea they'd ever heard of. Um, Brenner liked that idea. He called me and thanked me for that idea. <laughs> um, well, um, if we want to make health care work, we've got to free the patient, we've got to free the doctor, and then we've got to free the hospital. So I'm asked all the time, 
uh, can markets really work in healthcare? The most frequent question I get asked. And my answer is, it's the only thing that works in healthcare. Now you show me a healthcare market where there's no Blue Cross, no employer, no Medicare, Medicaid, and that's a healthcare market that probably works pretty well. Now just looking around this room, I'm gonna guess that most of you don't know a whole lot about the market for cosmetic surgery. All right? <laughs> but just give it 10 years and even you will get answers in this market. Here's a market where we don't have any of those third party payers. And you may not like to hear this considering the business you're in. But when patients pay their own money in healthcare markets, those markets work pretty well. So for cosmetic surgery over the last 15 years, the real prices have been going down, down, down. Even as the real price of every other type of surgery has been going up. And even with all kinds of technological change and the type of code increases costs everywhere else. And uh, even with huge increase in volume, like five to six hundred percent, with all that going on, the real price is still going down. LASIK surgery, the same thing. As in, uh, as in cosmetic surgery, you have a package price. You know what you're going to pay. You compare prices. In LASIK surgery, it's pretty easy to compare quality as well. You pay more or higher quality. Real price of uh, LASIK surgery has gone down. I think 25 percent over the last decade. Uh, there's a market that works really well. We mentioned the many clinics. Rx.com came into existence to cater to who? To cater to you and me, people paying out of pocket for drugs. They're competing with a local pharmacy. And I guarantee you, if Blue Cross was their client, there never would have been an Rx.com. If Blue Cross was the client, there never would have been a many clinic. And all the really innovative things, raise quality, reduce prices that I know about, are coming in Teladoc here in Dallas. Talk to Dr. Michael. All of this stuff came into existence by entrepreneurs trying to solve people problems, not trying to solve employer problems or insurance company problems, certainly not trying to solve uh, government problems. Uh, so we've got free the patient, free the doctor, and free the entrepreneur. Now along comes Obamacare, and I want to just briefly mention four huge problems with it that, um, that we're going to solve with the Section Cassidy bill. And before I leave here, I want to make sure you all know, you can answer all your questions about that bill, and also that you know where you can go to learn more about it, which is basically our website. Um, problem number one, we have a mandate that requires all of you to buy a product whose cost is going to increase faster than your income. It's certainly going to increase faster than the average person's income. Uh, and Barack Obama didn't create this problem, uh, for the last 40 years, real capital health care spending has been growing at twice the rate of growth of real capital income. And that isn't just a United States problem, it's a worldwide problem, at least in the developed world. And we are not the worst, we're sort of in the middle of the European average. But it's just a fact of life that health care spending has been growing like that, and uh, income has been growing at a slower rate. And if we stay on that path, by the time today's college students reach retirement, uh, we'll crowd everything else out. Uh, they won't have anything to eat, nothing to wear, no place to live, but they'll have really great health care. That'll be all there is. Um, obviously, that cannot happen. Um, now, what Obama did, or Obamacare does, is it, um, it doesn't help us get off that path. In fact, it locks us into it. It requires you to buy a pack of benefits, and the cost of those benefits is going to grow faster than your income. Meanwhile, over on the government side, they have protected themselves. I don't know if you all know this. I, I'm the only person I know their rights about it. But it's in the Obamacare bill, the Affordable Care Act, that Medicare is going to grow no faster, just a tiny bit faster, than national income. In other words, so if healthcare is going like this, Medicare is going to go like this forever. That's in the act. So they limit their expenditures on seniors and disabled. <coughs> Medicaid hospital spending, the same thing. It's going to grow at the rate of growth of income. The subsidies and exchanges, same thing. It's going to grow after 2018, same rate of growth of income. So the thing you have to buy is going like this. All the help you get from government is going like this. And we're going to get squeezed, squeezed, squeezed. So obviously, that's not the change. The second huge problem is um, Different subsidies uh, depending on where you get your health insurance. So in most places in this country, if you're a family of four, you're 138% of poverty. 
Uh, you can go into the Medicaid, and the government offers you a health plan that, let's say, costs about $8,000. You don't pay any. So let's call that an $8,000 gift. Now, if you make one more dollar of income, they kick you out of Medicaid, you go into exchange, but you get highly subsidized insurance. Let's say it costs $12,000. The government pays for almost all of it. Let's call that an $11,000 gift. So here's $8,000 gift, $11,000 gift. But if you work for the hotel over here on the highway, a few blocks away, um, almost, I don't know if you ever notice who works at hotels, but, but almost everybody around there is making $15, $20 an hour. Um, and, um, and now they're expected to buy, they and their employer, something they cannot afford, something that costs a third or half as much as they're earning. And if they don't buy it, they get fined. So what I've just described to you is $8,000 gift, $11,000 gift, fines. Uh, and all these people are about the same income level. Uh, that's a crazy way to design a healthcare system. And on the employer side, it causes employers to totally redesign who they want to hire, how many hours they work, and all kinds of problems that you all are familiar with. Number three, and I'm the only guy who writes about this, I don't know why, but we have a race to the bottom in health insurance exchanges. And we see this right here in Dallas. And Blue Cross started out and had a PPO, you can go to a lot of different places, now it has an HMO. Nobody in the Dallas exchange includes Southwestern, right? And all over the country we see health insurers doing what? They have concluded that healthy people buy on price. They don't look around your network. <laughs> Why would I look at your network if I'm healthy? Knowing that if I ever get sick, then I'll start looking for another plan if I need one. Uh, so the whole system discourages healthy people from paying any attention at all to networks. Um, and so narrow networks, high deductibles, really sticking into the people who need specialty drugs, other people who are sick, other people who have cancer, AIDS, really uh, putting upfront costs on them. And why are they doing this? Because they want to attract the healthy and they want to avoid the sick. And these perverse incentives don't stop uh, at the point of entry. After folks are in your plan, uh, the same incentives are there. You want to, uh, if they're healthy, you want to keep them. The incentives really over provide the healthy because you want to keep the ones you have and attract more of them. Under provide the sick because you don't want the ones you have, you wish they'd go somewhere else, and you certainly don't want any more. And the fourth big problem is on the buyer side. Uh, I don't need to tell you all about this, but you, you probably know it better than I do, that healthy people are uh, remaining uninsured. They're turning down tons of dollars of subsidies because they find ways that they don't have to pay a fine. And then when they get sick, they find a way to enroll, and they don't have to wait open season, they can roll any time during the year, they can you know, they lose their electricity or get bullshit, or lose, lose their job, or do almost anything. So on the buyer side, folks have become very skilled in gaming the system. In Massachusetts, he's called jumpers and dumpers. You know, they, they jump in uh, when they're sick, they get their medical care, they get their bills paid, and then they, uh, they dump the plan after, uh, after their health care. Obviously, if we all do that, we'll just speed for the death spiral and uh, every insurer that I know of, all our insurers are complaining about this. So this is uh, it's a problem I wrote about before I heard from them, but, uh, but they're confirming this huge problem in the market. So those are four big problems. Now, what do we do in the sessions past the bill? And then I'm going to open up for you. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me that, um, you ever heard of Mizuka, folks in Japan? Um, what happens if you're a member of the Japanese mafia and you commit a major mistake? You know what you have to do? You have to sever one of your fingers, and then you offer that finger to your sister by way of atonement. Uh, and I've often thought if um, members of our Congress, members of the Bomb Administration, would like honor the Japanese mafia, we have a lot less finger pointing away. <laughs> All right, what are we going to do about this? Uh, we get rid of the mandates. So, individual mandate, so employer mandate. We have a, uh, we let people choose. You choose insurance needs, your needs, meet your family's needs, not the needs of the government or special interest. Uh, so, choice. Number two, we have fairness. 
for the first time ever in the tax code, the government is going to treat everybody the same. A universal tax credit that can vary by geography and by age, but it does not vary by income. So Bill Gates, the guy who mows Bill Gates' as lawn, well, are going to get the same help from government. And you get this help regardless of where you get your insurance, at work, in the marketplace, <coughs> the exchange, same uh, help across the board. Uh, all of this stops government from becoming the source of our problems. All of this means government has a neutral role. We give people help, but we, we don't allow that help to influence where they go to work or where they get their insurance. We let the market into your choice to uh, determine all those. All the anti-job provisions of Obamacare are gone. Everything that interferes with portability is gone. And even before there was Obamacare, all of you know that uh, it was basically against the law for employers to buy individually owned insurance for their employees with pre-tax dollars. Um, but you probably also know that in a lot of states it was no mass help tell. So employers were doing it anyway. Uh, Texas was one of the worst states. Uh, you all can tell me if this is true. I've been told in Texas you have an affirmative obligation to make sure that the, the money that pays for the individual policy didn't come from the employer. Is that right? Uh, that, that makes us worse than just about anywhere else. Uh, yet when you do public opinion polls, uh, guess what polls the highest in public health care? It's portability. People want portability. They want portability more than just about anything else. Um, now, Obama comes along, and they have a serious, serious problem because basically, for everybody who makes below average income, uh, you get a better deal in exchange than you do at work as far as the tax subsidy is concerned. You make above average income, it's the other way around. So basically, that means about half of the country, uh, about half of 150 million people would gain if they could substitute the insurance in exchange for their employer. That would be a financial gain for them under a policy. So what does Obama do for the administration? Uh, they, um, well you all know this, the, 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 the fine is what, $100 per employee per day, okay? This is the largest fine in Obamacare. <laughs> of all the things you could do to, to make the government unhappy, this is the, the worst thing you can do. <laughs> this is the biggest fund for, for this kind of thing. Well, okay, all that goes away under our bill. Uh, since we have a uniform tax credit, we don't have any reason to care if people can get their insurance. We'll let the market determine that. We'll let individual choice determine that. And if employers want to go to the defined benefit system, which I think almost all small employers would do, by the way, uh, because they won't want to be in the healthcare. So they put up a certain amount of money and let their employees make choices. They can, they can control the choices or they can let them go to the exchange. Uh, and they would now be allowed to do all this. So we can have personal and portable health insurance, all obtained through employers, maybe obtained the same way they uh, do it today. Instead of buying Blue Cross group, uh, the employer can buy Blue Cross individual for his employees, and then they can own the insurance and they can take it with them. Um, on the, uh, the problem of the employees uh, or individuals gaining the system, what we do is um, we don't have a mandate, but we're also not going to have all these loopholes. And so this is going to work like Medicare. If you don't sign up when you're first eligible to sign up, you're going to get penalized. And we give the state some options. And one option is what they do in Part B and Part D of Medicare. You know, sign up each month, the premium goes up. Or they can do what we do with Medigap, and that means if you don't sign up when you're first eligible, they can underwrite you. Charge you a premium that reflects the real actuarial cost of your healthcare. Then finally, and probably the most difficult thing to explain, but the most important thing, this is uh, something I had in Senator Cassidy's bill last year. I, I called it uh, health status insurance or health status risk adjustment. I actually think of this free market risk investment for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But um, he went to Alexander, and Senator Alexander couldn't understand it, so he dropped it out of his bill last year. It's now in the bill. Uh, and I said, well, why did you do that? That's the most important thing to say. I don't care if Alexander can't understand it. If the health insurance market doesn't work, 
all the insurers have perverse incentives to, to, to avoid the sick and, and only attract the healthy, then, uh, then we're going to have terrible, terrible outcomes. So we have to correct that. And the way we correct that is um, by uh, making sure that no insurance plan can dump its sick, costly patients on another plan. That's, that's the correct What Obamacare did, and it did this in many different ways, but it allowed uh, the state of Texas to dump its risk pool into the exchange. And same for every other state that had a risk pool. And then we allowed places like Detroit to dump 10,000 over high cost folks into the exchange where, where they're paying uh, just because they're old and they're paying for you way below what they should be paying. And then we allowed all of the large corporations around the country, and they're doing this, to end their post-retirement health care. Remember, these are all older or costly folks. They go in exchange where their premium is artificially low for allowing them to dump their cost of those in exchange. So if you want to know why we have a death spiral problem is because if we started out allowing uh, folks to dump their high cost families on some other thing, we're going to end that. And that uh, I, I don't, just rescuing what we have now is going to be hard, but we don't want any more of that to go on. So if I have a plan in you and uh, I have a cancer patient and I send it to you, if I mistreat it, let's say, it's going over your plan. Um, he pays silver to silver, he's going to pay uh, the same premium as other silver members in your plan. But then I have to top that up, so you get an actual repair premium. Now how do we decide what that is? We're going to use the Medicare Advantage risk adjustment formulas. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. This is the most sophisticated risk adjustment program in the whole world. It may not be very good, but it's got 70 variables and some tests we have right now. It's in Medicare Advantage. It seems to work reasonably well in the Medicare Advantage program. So they give us a risk score. And, uh, and that's the starting point. If you and I can't agree, that's going to be the premium. But, uh, but we're free to improve on that. And if we want to have six months look back, 12 months look back, and all kinds of stuff that we won't think about here today, uh, we're, we're free to do it. In other words, we're free to grow for better risk adjustment. That's why I call it free market risk, risk adjustment. There's some parameters that the government says. Other than that, the insurance industry itself is free to grow, try this, try that. And in each state, you can do it a different way because we give lots of freedom to states to experiment this way. Uh, I will tell you that I sat down with AHIP, and it's AHIP's vision for the future that the same risk adjustment coming from Medicare Advantage. I mean, they're, they're, they plan to use that as well. The difference is that um, for AHIP, they want the risk adjustment to be plan to plan. In other words, if um, I'm a plan and you're a plan, at the end of the year I have losses, you have profits, uh, you have to write me a check. <laughs> and, they're, and they're going to use the, the, the Medicare Advantage uh, risk adjustment form to determine how big the check has to be. But I said to them, well, look, suppose that the reason why I have losses, I didn't take care of my people, and didn't do a good job, but I still get a check. Yeah, I still get a check. So I sort of politely said, you know, that sounds kind of like private sector social. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Well, that's what they want. Um, they, they want to be like utilities. And um, so I sat down with Ron, um, uh, former head of that. Uh, and no, the top is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, one week. Thank you. Alzheimer's uh, one. And he and I talked through this, and I said, look, look, we want to, we don't want to pay, we don't want to protect insurance companies, we want to protect patients. We want the patient to be valuable. Uh, if the insurance company can't make it, that's too bad, they're not there to save the man. So we really want to encourage specialization, which is what we don't have now. We want to get cancer treatment centers in America really thinks it's really good. They think they can do a better job of treating cancer patients than anybody else. Let them advertise. Uh, let the patients go join their plan. Let them get a fair premium. And uh, we'll see what happens. And if it turns out they're not as good as they thought they were, then patients can move somewhere else. But, but we want to, and, and then Gingrich agrees with this too, but we want to encourage focused factories. We want to encourage centers of excellence. 
And another stuff about not asking health questions, uh, under the market, I'm imagining you, know, you you have to produce your health records or get the treatment. The Centers of America doesn't have to accept you. you know, we want to know if you have a problem that, that we're ready to solve. And also, we're changing the privacy rules uh, so that um, uh, rec medical records automatically go with uh, patients. And you all probably already know that you know, when, uh, when we switch health insurance plans today, uh, the medical records usually don't go. You know, the reason they don't go is if I'm in your plan, I'm going to move over here. Well, once I decide to move over here, I'm not paying premiums to you anymore, so why do you even want to bother collecting my records and sending them with me? And so it's not happening. Uh, and so we're going to reverse that. This is, this is, if you, you want to opt out, you can't, otherwise you're in, and the records go with you. <laughs> um, now I want to let you all, I want to hear from you on what, what you think about this. Uh, let me just say, I was introduced as a part of health savings account. Uh, I have a little different view of it than most of you and most of the people who, who have not talk about it. Uh, normally, people think of this as a financial thing, and it is a thing. Uh, it's a way to save money and benefit from savings. But, uh, you know, my first book, a pretty really important book in this area, is called Patient Power. And for me, the health savings account was always more about power than it was about money. And I have to think that the healthcare system can be cold and indifferent, and can treat you in uncaring in different ways. Not always, but it can happen. And so I always believe that if you retain the power and the money, the system's gonna work better for you than if you see the power and the money as something personal for your artists. Thank you all very much.
basically, you know, the, the, it just caused problems for them to not have every hospital in their network. But, you know, under the subsidy system I just described to you, uh, and Laura could say, you know, we got twelve thousand dollars here. If we just take out four or five hospitals in Dallas Fort Worth, the ones that are high quality, low cost, and that's our network, we could probably knock six thousand dollars out of the insurance costs. I don't think that's unreasonable. And what happens to six? It can become dollar for dollar take home pay. So the employer can say to the employee, let's knock out six, you know, let's go to this narrow network looks pretty attractive, you can take $6,000 more, or they can divide it up in some way. Um, so <coughs> with this new system, uh, and the reason it's optional, I would mean, me, it would not be optional. The reason it's optional is because I get tired of arguing with people about it. You know, I sit down with the bars, they don't understand it, and I spend a whole day at the AFL-CIO building watching the whole day, and at the end of the day, they all, they all liked it pretty well. They all thought their members were getting it. But uh, I don't have time to go talk to every union. So let's just put in the law. Let's let people in their own good time <laughs> discover what's good for them. And they'll change the system a lot. From the, uh, the concern I have is that what, they, what the government has done under Obamacare, what we all agree is, 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 is terrible. And it has pretty well destroyed the individual marketplace. And now we're basically going to be looking at something that has the potential to destroy the individual marketplace, especially in the smaller companies under 100. They are going to be going out and negotiating and designing their own plans. And, and so there's, there's a real incentive for them to totally get out of that uh, deal, putting more people in that individual marketplace, which they no longer really exist. So how are we going to avoid that? And it sounds like a lot of this stuff is it's not insurance anymore. It's just a different way of, of the welfare program. Right. Um, what we're trying to do in this bill is remove government as a source of the problem. The government for years and years encouraged group insurance over individual insurance. It encouraged third party insurance mm -hmm. over self insurance and health savings. It, it gives us all these perverse incentives. What we're doing in this bill is we're making government neutral for all these choices. And that means that employers will decide what, if an employer has something to offer that people cannot get on their own, and maybe buying the book is one of those things. But if he has something to offer, he probably is going to offer it. Uh, but we're not going to force the employer into doing things he's no good at. So if he wants to buy in bulk, but it's going to be individually owned insurance, and people have choices, fine. Well, let's, let's, let's gravitate toward that. Uh, we're going to let the market and the choice respond, uh, and, and the government's not, if any problems that result will not, the government will not be caused. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, um, would you please review again how you would, or the mechanisms you would use to, let's not say get everybody in the list we're going to have, to get a sufficient number of people in the world to make anything work. Under, under this plan, there's no reason for anyone to be uninsured because we're not only going to offer people a tax credit, but we're, we're getting rid of a mandate. So on the supply side, insurers will be able to compete down what they have to offer to the level of the tax credit. So if it's a family of four, the credit is $8,000, the insurers will be able to offer an $8,000 plan. It may not be as robust as what you, you were used to, and it may do things like the VA does. It may have a restricted drug phone. It may have a, a very restrictive network. Um, it's going to look, what you can buy for that credit, and the fact the credit is chosen to be roughly equal to the federal government's contribution to a well-managed, privately administered Medicaid. So it's going to look kind of like Medicaid, kind of like the VA system. You want better than that, you may have more dollars. But there's no reason for anybody to be unsure of unless they're lazy. Which they are. Which they are. <laughs> and then therefore, and we, we anticipate that some, just as you say, some people won't be in the group. And we're going to do something new that's never been done before in any other health care bill. Some portion of the unclaimed tax credit will go to local safety and institutions. 
And that's the only money the safety net institutions are going to get from the federal government. So if everybody in Dallas decides to be privately insured, the federal money will be subsidizing a private insurer. Sure, and the partner will not be getting anything from the federal government. If everybody in Dallas decides to be uninsured, which they can because we give them the choice, uh, then all of the government's money will be going to partners and other safety net institutions. So money will follow the people. Thank you. 
First thing it does is it gets rid of a very inefficient way of doing what you just described. Because as I think all of you know, uh, under Obamacare, uh, if you're a healthy woman, you have no symptoms, you're entitled to free mammogram, right? But if you have symptoms and you really need the mammogram, then you could have to pay out of pocket for the whole thing. Now that's the way it's set up. So those are horrible incentives. We're going to get rid of that. Um, we're also going to get rid of the perverse incentives to have those really high deductibles. Um, this is an aside. You know how all the fast food restaurants are dealing with this? I mean, they are basically saying, okay, employee, uh, here's your plan. It's a bronze plan. It's got $6,000 deductible. Uh, you have to pay 9.5% of your income. And you want your family there, you pay all of their premium. And they turn it down. You know, any customer who runs Carl's restaurant, so 1% take that up. And everybody else turns it down. So we're ending those perverse incentives. We're going to allow the uh, uh, benefit insurance, and that is pretty much first dollar coverage, although money could go in a savings account, a health savings account. Um, so we're going to get rid of the incentive to have ridiculously high deductibles, certainly in relationship to these folks. Anyway. Yes? A couple questions. Number one, I can see this also maybe helping out the DA to be able to get rid of the DA, give them true choice just set it at that level if they want to buy more they could do so correct and then finally also we can comment on i didn't see any i didn't hear you mention uh any kind of tort reform does that enter into anything or well you're right about the va and uh the va could be um the va could compete in the market by any place uh, we don't just need to privatize it if you think you know if you want the government to have some portion of it let it compete uh, i don't mind medicaid competing with private insurance. Yeah, it would improve Medicaid, but if it did, they'd lose all their customers in the private market. Now, tort reform, uh, I have um, radical ideas on it, not in the bill, because we regard that as a state issue. But um, I have some very radical ideas on that, which you can find by going online. Um, and uh, I want to get the, the courts out of this. Uh, so I want to. Uh, I want the voluntary contract to uh, have, uh, have my wealth without fault. And I, 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 I could spend 30 minutes on this, but I won't. Uh, let me just say, um, before we get out of here, that at my website, which is goodwininstitute.org, uh, you can find uh, not only the bill itself, but you can find the 12 bold ideas, uh, almost all, most of which we've talked about. And then for each of the 12 bold ideas, like, like health status or risk adjustment, there is a link to a short white paper. So there's a white paper on the risk adjustment, there's a white paper on limited benefit insurance, the credit, why is it the level of duty? So all that's available to you, and it's the only place you can get it. Now, Cassidy doesn't have this session doesn't have this. <laughs> you have to come to our website to get it. Um, but I want you to know it's there. And also, if you want to get regular stuff from me, I mean, because I'm writing about this all the time. Um, give me a business card, and I'll put you on a mail list, and you'll get an email from me probably once a week. Yes, ma'am. Um, you, you opened uh, in touch on risk pools. I was reading an article that um, Alaska was thinking about maybe using a certificate of risk pool there along with the ACA uh, in their markets. Uh, would we, our risk pool in Texas, if it's about 300% of what um, an average person would pay, and I feel like our what we're going to allow is the reverse engineering of this we're not going to require it but the state of texas will be able to recreate the risk pool, or what i think makes a little more sense is a, a reinsurance arrangement um, the patient doesn't have to move anywhere. Well, we need to segregate financially these high-cost patients who shouldn't have been in this pool in the first place from healthy patients whose premiums are way too high. And I would pay taxes on my premium to help with that risk okay. I mean, you know, I want other people to have insurance too, but there's a, it seems like there's a way, if you know what it is, you can identify it and manage it financially when I mean, you can't. And just, we allow that. 
we give, I can't emphasize enough how much power we actually give the states. And they're all not going to respond the same way. Up in New York, they're going to screw their market up. Um, and you know that will happen, right? Uh, who has missed it? Under our risk adjustment, we do not need to overgrow. Under our, if we do this right, people can switch lands any time during the year. The only reason we have open enrollment in Obamacare is because um, of the perverse incentives. Nobody's paying real premium. But if every time you move, the premium that the new insurer gets is a real premium, actuarially fair, uh, you can move any, move anytime you want during the year. We do not need the open enrollment. Uh, we, open enrollment also doesn't make any medical sense. If somebody's got cancer, don't we want to move them quickly to somebody who's good and dealing with cancer? Why wait 11 months? So I'm not telling the state it, ha it has to get rid of that open enrollment, but I'm saying that we will move the original motivation for it. Do you think like every provider becomes their own insurance company? No. Yeah. No. Are you saying the state can uh, decide whether they have a uh, guaranteed issue or not? Uh, we feel like we can't get away from the guaranteed issue. All right? That, that, uh, that that's, uh, I don't like it. Never have liked it. But we feel like the, the public is, remember how we got there. The, Government encourages us all to be in group plans where the insurance is not worth it. Then when we leave our employer, we are sick and we got a problem. So government created a problem and the public in its mind thinks, well, the only answer is guaranteed issue. So this not make sense. So yes, that's still going to be there. But as I said, we're not going to let people gain the system. You know, the state can impose severe penalties on them, uh, including total underwriting. Uh, and when people do move, uh, the, the acquiring insurer has to be paid an actuarially fair premium. And uh, so we, we get rid of the perverse incentives there and there now. Yeah. Who's going to pay this actuarially sound premium? Insurer to insurer. And remember where Obamacare is going anyway. All the risk adjustment is within the exchange. It's insurance companies writing checks to each other. We're just going to do it the right way. They're doing it the wrong way. What about the cost of Prescriptions. Uh, that seems to be one of the most frustrating parts of the way it's going out of the way of uh, pharmaceuticals, gaming system, et cetera. But I'm talking more in the bigger picture. We're overpaying for our prescriptions because other countries have price controls. And I'm a free enterprise guy. I don't want price controls except for being taken advantage of. We're doing, we're subsidizing all the research and development for the whole world because of that. Could we do something along the lines of we're only going to pay the average of the top five other industrialized countries? We're, we're going to stop subsidizing R&D in the toughest legal environment in the world. We could do a lot of things. Uh, the theory is we'll screw everything up. Remember, if we are doing the R&D for the whole world, it would be really bad to quit doing it. So it would have a valuable thing. Let's say we lost. Yeah, we have a valuable industry doing valuable stuff. Now, in our bill, we are going to allow insurers to do things like the VA does. We're not tell them to do it. But if, if to get the cost down to $2,500, which is all some people will want to pay, uh, we're going to allow them to have a restricted formula, like the VA. So, so that's, um, that's going to be possible. If that's not where the plan will probably want to be. Uh, and we're also going to give them the freedom to say, hey, look, look for marginal drugs, life saving drugs, in the bike, care, you know. Plan wants to say, hey, we're not we're not paying for certain things like like Britain. You know how it works in Britain? You you uh, uh, have cancer. There's a drug that probably keep your life life four or five more months. The National Health Service won't pay for it. Um, if you have a lot of money, you can pay for it out of pocket. They allow that. Uh, what we're going to allow is for you to insure for that when you want to. So or choose not to. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the final question since I get to do that because I'm running the meeting today. But I'm making an easy question. Yeah, no, I, I think it's helpful to maybe to can you tell us how this bill fits in Paul Ryan wrote a white paper 
obviously what the presidential election will make a big impact on where things go, but how does this paper fit in with the rest of the Republican Party and Paul Ryan? Well, if you look at some things I wrote, one thing I handed out maybe, it looks like there's a lot of similarity. And there is, there's a refundable tax credit and, and both, um, and uh, some other similarities. But at the end of the day, the Ryan Task Force is only focused on about 20 million people that, 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 that got insurance because of Obamacare. They're ignoring the whole employer market, ignoring 150 million people, except for the Cadillac tax. Um, and we think that Cadillac tax will be horrible in the election. The 300 members of the House have said they want to abolish the Obamacare Cadillac tax, and yet Ryan comes out with a plan where the only source of funding is the Republican Cadillac tax, which is going to be even worse than the Obamacare Cadillac tax. So uh, I'm not to be go out of the room, uh, but, uh, because I don't, I'm not criticizing their plan publicly, but the fact of the matter is it didn't think it through, and, um, uh, our bill is very well thought through. We, we spent a year and a half uh, on this bill. Of 12 old ideas, six have never appeared in any bill before. And we found out when you write this kind of legislation, it has to work together. And if you're going to put a health savings account with a tax credit, it needs to be a Roth account. So things like that that we thought through that the task force didn't think through. Well, thank you, Dr. Goodman. Uh, Dr. Goodman and his institute work with us to make him available today. He's obviously a, a in-demand speaker, so okay. thank you, thank Eric. <laughs>